Welcome to our workshop. You are with us for In Search of Safety, the Shrinking Asylum Space and Challenges for Asylum Seekers at the US-Mexico border. My name is Susan Crabiel and I am the Associate for Migration Accompaniment Ministries with the Presbyterian Church USA. We are honored to be joined today with two speakers who not only have years of experience working with people forcibly displaced, but who also bring their own lived experiences to our understanding of the causes of uprootedness and the need for just and humane immigration policies. We are living in a time of great upheaval. Over 100 million people are estimated to be forcibly displaced from their homes, about one half inside their own country and the other half seeking safety around the world. In today's workshop, we will look at the case of Honduras and the struggle Hondurans face to stay, and the reasons many are leaving. Then we will shift to the U.S. border, the asylum policies of the U.S. government, and current efforts to limit access to asylum. Today, right now, the House of Representatives is marking up yet another anti-asylum bill, the Border Reinforcement Act of 2023. We will conclude our time together with information on how faith communities and faith leaders are working together to address the causes of forced migration and the U.S. commitment to asylum. And you are invited to uh, put questions into the chat during the course of the workshop, and we hope to get time to answer some of those later. Our first speaker today is Jose Artiga, a longtime human, environmental, and human rights, rights advocate in the United States and Central America, and the executive director of the Fisher Foundation. In the interest of time, I won't read his whole bio, but I invite you um, to read that for yourself. In addition, uh, we are being joined by Rana Asiratam, the Director of Government Relations for Network Lobby for Catholic Social Justice, where she develops and executes strategy to advance their agenda with the administration and Capitol Hill. So welcome to Jose and to Rana. And we're going to start our workshop with a few words from Jose. Thank you. Buenos dias. Good morning from San Francisco, California. Um, and thank you, Susan, and all the organizers for this wonderful uh, event. Honduras is a unique uh, place of um, close to us. And uh, a few years ago, uh, we saw the big caravans, you know, thousands of people that caught the attention of um, the media. It was also used, you know, by the Trump administration, you know, showing and threat, you know, the threat that they are, um, <clears throat> that they could uh, cause to the U.S., which is, is not true. But the timing of the caravans, you know, uh, was very closely related to the elections of 2017. Elections in which people saw again, you know, the, the corruption, uh, the stealing of the elections, and perhaps the end of democracy um, at that time. Usually we ask the big question, you know, why people leave, or perhaps why they didn't leave before, and why they are leaving now. And, and Honduras is a, is a case study to try to answer that question, um, which is a very difficult um, to pin down, you know, because it has multiple uh, reasons. You know, you will have the threat of the gangs um, that put, you know, uh, extortion fee on, on people. You see also the, the policies of the Juan Orlando Hernandez, the dictator that came after the coup in uh, 2009. Um, and so there are multiple, multiple reasons for why uh, people are leaving. But what is important is that the numbers are big. The numbers are dramatically uh, larger than, than before. Um, 
perhaps we also need to see policies, you know, because after, you know, a 40 year period, after, you know, uh, a number of years, we can see the results of a number of, um, of policies. For instance, <clears throat> Honduras is a very rich country, you know, with resources. And we can see trillions of palm oil trees being planted where people used to plant corn and beans and vegetables and fruits. You know, these lands are being physically um, occupied by this tree that displays, you know, everything, including animals, including animals that don't find it um, hospitable uh, to live in those, in those uh, lands. Um, another area is, you know, the, the native um, African Hondurans, you know, the Garifona. The Garifona have lived there for over 200 years in the coast. Um, and somehow the tourist industry found, you know, the beautiful beaches and they are physically uh, being displaced. And you will see Garifona now, you know, in, in Mexico or in different cities in New York as they have been uh, displaced by this tourist uh, in the industry. Then you have thousands, not hundreds, thousands of concessions where the government physically allows these companies to come and mine Honduras. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Berta Cáceres, you know, as she was um, fighting these companies that are coming to Honduras to produce electricity, uh, to um, get all the minerals. Uh, of, of Honduras. So those policies that at different times are blessed and supported or encouraged by the United States are contributing to people um, living, forcing them, forcing them out. This year, we are celebrating the life of Father uh, Jesuit, uh, Father um, James Carney. He was disappearing in Honduras 40 years ago. And for what Father Carney was saying at that time was something wrong in this country. You know, a, a beautiful, a rich in resources country with these levels of poverty. You know, how come uh, uh, poverty is happening in a country that is uh, so rich? 40 years later, we can say the same adding one new component, which is um, the component of um, migration, you know, people, people living. We can, with the information that we have right now, we can predict, you know, we can project how uh, Central Americans uh, will be in 10 or 20 years. Uh, one example is El Salvador, where over 30%, you know, that's the fine, the, the, uh, you know, actual um, count that 30% of Salvadorians have left, you know, perhaps as a result of the war policies of, of the 80s. The actual number might be, might be much bigger, but the actual number might be 40%. So imagine that Central Americans will be 50% leaving their country and coming to the United States. That's you know what uh, could could happen um, in the in the future of of the region because the policies you know that slowly and in the last few years not too slowly have pushed people out. On top of that, you have natural disasters that are not too natural you know, because they are also uh, related to. Uh, policies of destroying uh, Mother Earth. And when this natural disaster hit, you know, like the hurricanes of Eta and Iota, people that were already poor, that were already displaced, now lose everything. And joining a caravan or number of people going uh, to the United States uh, just increases. 
Uh, so we need to be aware of that when we talk about um, policies. You know, later on we'll we'll develop more on what to on what to do. But there are a couple of things that I want to call the, the attention. You know, right now we have a tour of 20 cities of water defenders um, from Honduras in the United States. They will be in Washington D.C. You know, in the next uh, couple of days. But they are um, asking us to support them in one particular initiative, you know, which is a United Nations International Commission to uh, address the issue of uh, impunity and corruption uh, in Honduras. The, pre the president, the new president of Honduras is, is fine to, to invite that, that commission. The United Nations is, is willing to do it. But it needs a little bit of pressure. It, need, it needs our representatives to, to embrace uh, this very particular initiative uh, that will bring you know, people that uh, are violating the human rights of Hondurans, that are stealing you know, uh, resources, and that there hasn't been um, any uh, justice uh, for them. Um, so that commission is a very important, very concrete uh, step. We talk uh, more about uh, accompaniment, and I end with this. When we do policies, when we try to address the issue, let's talk to the people on the ground. You know, um, our you know, program is accompaniment. Let's accompany them, which means physically uh, go down to Honduras, you know, go down to Guatemala, go down to Mexico, and get to know them. You know, uh, remove the numbers and get to know the testimonies uh, of people uh, and see what they are uh, proposing. Uh, accompany, accompany them, and together um, try to find a solution. Just remember that um, these are the people of God. You know, these are our brothers and sisters, um, and that we need to move away from an immigration policy that focus on security at the border to a human right, uh, 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 an immigration policy that focus on human rights. That will be a, a gigantic change. Again, thank you for organizing this event and for highlighting the, the situation of Honduras because they uh, want a solution and they want to do it uh, together with us. Blessings and thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. You gave us a great background on the situation in Honduras and a great segue to Rona to talk to us about what is happening in the US. Rona? Thank you so much. Just um, let me share my screen and uh, get on the way of, there we go. I um, just want to, again, thank you all for arranging this. Um, and thank you, Jose, uh, for your um, intervention. And, you know, this this is all linked, as Jose was saying. Uh, so today I will talk a little bit about, well, I will talk all about U.S. immigration and asylum policy, but I will talk a little bit more about the history of it, uh, then the current situation at the border, and then we will discuss uh, what we can do about it. Um, and as Susan was saying, I am, I was also an asylum seeker. I won't talk too much about my case, but I'm happy to um, answer any questions afterwards on that. Um, so basically in the United States, as you know, many of you might know, the seminal, the, the seminal policy or law at this point is the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. Uh, this came during the time of the civil rights movement uh, and what the big, you know, the big thing that it did, it took away quarters of ethnicity. Uh, before this, uh, from 1920 onwards, there, you know, there was a f focus on getting Northern and Western European people from Northern and Western European countries into the U.S., but this bill took away that and it allowed for more increased immigration from Asia and Africa. But the one other thing that it did was it created caps for uh, Western Hemisphere immigrants. So this is you know, people from 
Mexico, from Honduras, from Haiti, all of you know that area. So this had never been done before. And so while the 1965 Act is seminal and it really changed immigration and it made it much more open, one of the things that it did do was it did discriminate against uh, people from the Western Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere includes very much, um, as I said, Latin America and uh, you know Haiti, Dominican Republic, the Caribbean, basically. And this was a big problem. And this is sort of the, the reason that we have many of our conversations and many of the policies that came after. So before this, there were no caps on uh, people who could come from the Western Hemisphere, uh, people who could come from Latin America, and most of them uh, came, most of the people who came, uh, came for work. Uh, they were not considered illegal. Um, there was a flow of immigrants. There's always a flow of immigrants. And then there was, you know, there was a flow of immigrants who came for work from the Western Hemisphere, as well as, of, as people who came for permanent residency and, and came to seek asylum. Uh, but this uh, law then put a cap on who could get permanent residency from the Western Hemisphere. It started at 120,000. And then it also ended uh, the Brasero at the same time, not this law, but at the same time, uh, there was an ending of the Brasero program, which was a worker program. The Brasero program was terrible. It was horrible. But the problem was it was ended without anything to replace it. It could have, you know, if you put in more worker rights and things like that, th this was a, a, a program where there was legalization for uh, workers. And this, you know, as Jose was saying, um, you know, people move for many reasons. And uh, before this, you know, you would have your people, there would be flows of people work, moving. But now because, um, now because there's, you know, several issues uh, climate change, uh, war, etc. That you know, people are moving more for that as well. So, policies in the U.S. unfortunately are built in and, and thought of um, in a very sort of in, insular manner, without thinking about the wider world. Just as Jose was saying, thinking about the wider world and why people move. It's rather than what is important to us. How can and how can we stop it? And this. Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, it also, one of the things it did was it, it, it differentiated between refugees and asylum seekers. And may, like right now, this is not normal. This is not what happens in other countries uh, because t by law, there's it's just the differentiated is where you, where you are. You know, if you claim, if you come through the UNHCR, then you are, you are a refugee. But if you either you have to come to the border or be in the U.S. and then you claim asylum. But the the it's all about like you have been persecuted and you're fleeing persecution. That's all you need to prove. It's the same thing. Uh, but in the U.S., they make this differentiation, and that has made you know policy at the southern border or policy at the border much worse. So you know since this 1965 law, there have been like a series of other laws that have tightened and tightened. Um, what uh, what people can do, how people can seek asylum, and tightened and tightened migration, especially coming from uh, for people coming from the southern border. Uh, and you know, this is just a series of laws, and I could talk about it more. But the, we had to understand why that was, and that was because from 1965 you had the narrative. The narrative changed drastically. Uh, because since, you know, you have the tightening of policies and tightenings of laws uh, against um, most immigrants and mainly then, you know, that was against Chinese immigrants, Irish immigrants, um, as well as Latino immigrants. But you would see sort of much of the narrative being very anti-Latino. There's a quota of the Latino threat. Um, you know, Chavez, Leo Chavez, he did a real study on this and, uh, you know, for looking at magazine covers from 1970s to the 80s to 90s to see how Latino people were portrayed. And uh, he, that is where he came up with this, you know, the Latino threat. It was so negative in all, you know, in, for, th 
for 30 years was just an increasing of negativity of how Latino people were portrayed. Uh, and then, you know, the language used started from immigrant wave, flood our borders, and then it became a crisis at the border. And then we saw politicians also picking this up. So it was, on, and then it was only in 1980. Let's not forget, you know, before 1965, there was a lot of Latin, Latin American um, immigrants who came and they were not considered illegal at all. There were a lot of Irish, there was a lot of uh, Western European um, immigrants who came before 1965 and they were not considered without documents and they were not considered illegal at all. But after this, you know, the tightening of the laws, you start considering people illegal and then you have the politicians sort of pick it up. And in 1980, you see, you know, Ronald Reagan um, conflating national security with illegal immigration. And, you know, this has then led to, again, the, the threat. And then, you know, if you look at the language of the news, you know, we went from flooding our borders to a more militaristic sense of, you know, hordes and hordes and invasion and you know, that kind of language. Uh, that is in the narrative that of today. And then, you know, 1986, uh, we saw, again, Ronald Reagan talking about um, uh, that, you know, terrorists and subversives uh, just coming over the border. So this is all of what we're hearing today is not new. It did not also start with, uh, uh, with Donald Trump, unfortunately. It is simply just just exploded in many ways and it is explo the narrative has exploded in many ways versus the fact that you know the laws have got tightened and then you know it's easy to say oh this person is illegal or this you know, this is this is a criminal act when actually this is this is not so um the and the language is really really important we're seeing this all over the world um especially uh, black and brown immigrants um you know, being demonized and criminalized. Um, in this is happening in the UK as well, and it was happening in Germany uh, some years ago. But right now, it's happening in the UK. And um, I just want to introduce you to Joan Salter. She was a um, Holocaust survivor, and she's an educator in the UK. And and she was so upset uh, the way Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary in the UK, was talking about. Um, immigrants coming, especially the, you know, come on the boats. Um, and she was so, you know, it, it reminded her, her so much of what happened at the Holocaust. And she was saying, we, she confronted the, the Home Secretary, but, you know, the Home Secretary brushed her off. But it is words that make policy. I'm, I'm showing you this to understand that it is, it is the narrative and the words that, you know, that make policy. And, you know, if you, if you take the narrative and the stronger the narrative, you can see in that list of laws that I said, um, how much then, you know, the laws have changed because of the narrative. So it is our moral imperative as people of faith, I think, to, to change the narrative and use those words to change policy. Because as you know, Joan Salter says, such is the power of words, such is the fragility of civilization, because it does influence the way people think, and then you have different policies. Um, the, the, right now, our border does not look like it, does, it did in 1965. Uh, there are many people from many countries um, who come to the southern border, and it is, you know, it is really quite horrifying. Um, of how they get there. Uh, one of the larger non-Latin American groups are Haitians. Uh, again, they have had a hist long history of entering the country because of boat and land through boats and also through land. And as um, you know, Jose, Jose was talking about the Hondurans, this is the, the Honduran case study is, I think, you know, seminal to, to why people move. Again, it's both because they're not, it's not survivable. Um, you know, there's either war, there's famine, or there's um, climate change, and people want to live a good life. This is not something new. You know, people we saw even in the US, you know, people would, during, during a recession, people would move from New York to um, Nevada. So, you know, why is it that we, um, are having these barriers without an understanding 
of the movement of people. Also with Haitians, you know, there's been a long history of discrimination of Haitian immigrants in this country, and I can go into it a lot more, but um, you know, it, right, right now, like even though you, you, we see it in all the policies that are happening today, uh, both administrative policies, as well as uh, you know, the laws that are being passed or even being spoken about, uh, like Susan was talking about. Uh, the other part, the other, there are many, as I said, there were many countries uh, represented at the southern border, and it is, uh, it is because of the tightening laws. It is because people don't find safety in the country that is closest to them. You will see people from India who have passed through many, many countries. You, have, you will see people from the, the DRC, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and you will see people from China. Um, but again, this is because people have been, people really feel that their, their country is unlivable. They are, you know, and that is why they, they make this crazy trick all the way to the southern border. And also the other parts, so as I said, there's a difference between asylum seekers and refugees. You know, the other parts of entry to the US or to any other country have also been squeezed out. It is so much more difficult for either somebody from India or DRC to, you know, to, get, to be able to come to the US or any country that is closer by because the, the whole uh, environment of refugee and asylum policy has been stricter and closed down. Renat, uh, I know we're a little bit late in our time, so yes, I don't know if you I will. can do some of our I will. Yes, Wonderful. I will jump in very quickly. So, so. Um, you know, what is going to happen, one of the things at the you know, southern border, what is imminent is that, you know, May 11th, the Title 42 expulsion policy will end. Um, what will come next? We are not 100% sure, uh, but we know that there's like the CBP-1 uh, um, ability, the CBP-1, you have to take, you, know, you have to make a CBP-1 appointment. Uh, they are also having new policies of credible fear interviews in CBP custody, and there's a possible asylum ban rule. Uh, we can discuss all of this much more, and here are a few things that, you know, we can do. I can talk about it much more, but I, I will, you know, stop and uh, wait for questions. Thanks, Ronit. Sorry uh, to, to interrupt. I know we're running a little behind. Um, and you already touched a little bit on how discrimination, uh, racism, and xenophobia shows up at the border. Um, Jose, I'd like to give you a chance to also say, how does that impact the decisions of the Hondurans or, or reception of others that may be transiting through Honduras? Yeah, the uh, racism, you know, in the attack on you know, LGTB community, it will be multiplied. Um, and they suffer some of that in their home countries, you know, but on the route, on the way to the United States, uh, they will uh, receive attacks. You know, in fact, um, we were with the mothers, you know, which are now called the mothers of the disappear because their daughters uh, disappear on the way. Some of them will end up, you know, in prostitution, you know, and will be ashamed to even consider going back. Um, so that community is, um, I would say, double um, attack, double uh, suffering um, as, you know, there are all this, uh, even the gang members, you know, treat them, you know, with harsh, harsher um, ways of, you know, torture, um, dismembering them uh, just because they are of a different uh, color or of, of a different uh, sexual orientation. So uh, in, in fact, that community um, will, be, will be target on the way uh, in any um, psychological support when they get here, you know, in addition of, you know, what uh, immigrants suffer, but any psychological um, support, you know, will be uh, very, very important. Thanks. And Ronald, anything you want to add about what's happening uh, to people as they get to the border and treatment related to xenophobia or racism? 
Sure. In, especially in the U.S. policy, so right now, um, racism and uh, xenophobia, you know, shows up in, in many different ways. One is also the fact that, you know, in, sometimes in the ways the laws are written even, for example, uh, for TPS, uh, for Haitians, you know, there, there isn't a, a line that says that, you know, that Haitians can't be deported, even though the country has, has said, even though the, the State Department has said, you know, this is a country where people cannot live and this is why you're giving people temporary protection. Uh, but we still continue to deport people. While in other laws, for, for example, the Ukraine TPS, that, that line is really uh, there. Um, and so people are not deported. So that, one is the way the laws are written. And the other, you know, the way I would like to caution um, everyone when, when, you know, what Jose is saying is, is clear that, you know, people are on the way people are um, attacked and harassed because of racism and, and xenophobia. Um, you know, in Mexico, for example, um, you know, as they, as they pass through, uh, this, this is a real problem. But the fact that, you know, the US is saying, let's, um, you know, let's, let's criminalize more smuggling, let's, um, you know, have this quote unquote pathways, rather, which where you have to fulfill these certain things rather than uh, you know, be able to claim asylum at the border, that is really not helping. Uh, for example, you know, you have this parole programs, which is good, but it is limited. I think it's limited in number, but you would have things like you, you need a passport, uh, a valid passport. Uh, if you're from Haiti today, you know, the, the passport offices are closed. How are you going to get one? Same if you're in Venezuela. You cannot claim asylum in you know, if you are a black person, if you are indigenous, it is much more, or if you are um, uh, LGBTQI+, uh, it is much more difficult to claim asylum anywhere uh, in, you know, in Mexico or of any of those countries. So those kinds of policies that the U.S. is proposing right now, that is not helping and that is contributing to the xenophobia and uh, discrimination at the border and it just causing a lot of pain and distress. And so we must be mindful that this is really not, you know, parts to asylum when we when, when we're talking about. Thanks, Rhonda. And I think we've definitely seen that um, all these acts of deterrence actually haven't stopped people from leaving their home countries. Um, Jose, can you say a little bit about what your organization and others are doing uh, as people of faith um, to respond to these situations? I say uh, what we are doing, and I would like to emphasize on how we do it and how we should do it. Um, as people need to have faith, you know, <laughs> even when we see things that are falling apart, we are the ones, because if we are also not having faith, things will uh, fall apart. So we need to sing and we need to dance. So imagine, you know, uh, uh, when the buses are arriving to Washington, D.C., in addition of all the goodies that you bring, let's do a party right there. You know, Let's do music, let's gather, and, you know, let's, uh, let's celebrate that we are alive, you know, and that we have hopes. Um, then the, what we what we do is we organize delegations to El Salvador and to Honduras, and we organize people from those countries to come here to the United States. Over the last uh, 43 years, we have organized 10,120 delegates. So we invite uh, churches, uh, schools, you know, communities to consider going. Uh, yesterday we were in a um, bilingual school in Berkeley, and we have a delegation of teachers and uh, under 10 year old uh, kids going to Honduras you know, to, to see. We have um, a group of um, Berkeley High musicians, you know, will be traveling next year to sing, to, to, to bring their guitars and, and, to, and, to, and to walk with, with the people uh, down there because as as I said, you know, we are people of faith, you know, and we need to uh, celebrate 
that we are together, you know, that is that we are facing these policies, you know, these horrible things uh, with joy and trying to see how we wish the future to be. And is to be uh, the, the village, you know, uh, in which we in the north and in the south are, are together. And we built, you know, the, 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 the beloved community. And I will, I will emphasize that the way of how we do it is important. I will include in any meeting, you know, in any gathering, the singing, the dancing, even, you know, online we can dance, you know, um, and the sharing uh, bread and wine um, to, to celebrate that we are together in this. You know, we will not abandon them, even if Trump or the Santis come with worse, worse policies, we will work together um, to, to build a, a better community. Thank you, Jose. That's a powerful reminder of us that we need to live into our faith, right, and not be discouraged by all of these um, situations and all these stories. So thank you for that. Um, and I, you started to put a link, I believe, into the chat. I see the announcement about it, but I don't see the link itself. So you might have to do that secondly. Um, and our uh, Participants are asking about any other resources that we'd like to link. So I also invite both of you, if there's anything you want to drop into the chat for people to get further information or action items. Um, I know we are um, involved, many of us, in uh, advocacy at this point for policy. And Rona mentioned that on May 11th, the um, CDC rule related to um, keeping people out based on public health um, circumstances uh, is coming to an end. And so much of what we're seeing today uh, in terms of advocacy to continue to restrict uh, access to asylum is anticipation of that. Do you have any um, last comments or about that particular thing? I did do want to mention we are allowed to go a few minutes over. So if people want to stay on for just a few more minutes beyond our 45 minutes, we will do that before closing out. But Rana, anything else you want to add in terms of the actions people can take? Yes, I think it's really important, um, you know, when we are, because people are talking a lot about what's going to happen at the border. Uh, there are a lot of people in distress, you know, trying to get their appointments, trying to make sure that they can uh, come in, uh, you know, from now until, you know, whenever the border. There are several policies, you know, that, that, have been proposed and and, and which are not good. So, to write you know, writing to your president, our president, uh, talking to your Congress people, uh, it really does work. Even though you know you don't think the Congress person might be supportive or not, uh, that is really I think really continuing to be important because, again, it is the constant barrage of these you know horrible policies that we're seeing that is affecting real people on the ground. Thank you. And are there any last thoughts uh, that uh, you have, Jose, that you think is important for people to either to understand or for them to do? Well, I would say uh, we invite people to consider going um, to Honduras. You know, this September 10th, uh, we are celebrating the life of, um, you know, Father uh, Guadalupe Carney and uh, celebrating the struggle, you know, that has gone for 40 years. You know, not everything is negative. You know, we could be in worse situation, you know. Uh, so to um, join a delegation that will go September 10th to uh, September 18th to Honduras, um, we celebrate the life of the four religious women that were uh, assassinated uh, December 2nd. That's uh, El Salvador. Every December 2nd, we have um, those uh, delegations. So consider going. Uh, if you physically cannot go, consider sponsoring a young person. You know, we're working with uh, students of any age, uh, like this um, high school students from UC Berkeley, um, to, to work with the people because... People down there are tired, you know, and when they see that we come and we celebrate with them, they say we are still important. You know, we, we have faith and we need to reinforce 
the right to stay. We support the right to migrate. You know, people that need to migrate, they should migrate. You know, but also people that want to stay, we need to reinforce. Uh, and no matter how many people leave Central America, there will be a good number of people that would like to stay and you know plan their own um, food and uh, stay in contact. You know, with their um, in the United States. But the right to stay is very important. You know, it's not. Uh, one or the other. There will be families in which half of the family is already in the United States and the other half uh, is um, in, in Honduras and both are, both are good. But to stay, they need policies. They need you know, the basics. You know, they could not be left behind um, in poverty um, that is inhuman. You know? So we can contribute to, 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 work, to work with them. Thank you. Same questions for you, Ronald. Uh, any last advice or words of wisdom for us? Yes, I think you know we should use our faith and use our uh, our citizenship in the U.S. Uh, to to portray that you know all immigrants are human, and we should not forget that humanity. And uh, you know we have seen. Uh, I saw that you have put in the chat. You know the welcome with dignity, and we've seen you know how many people in the U.S. also welcome people. So to continue to do that, and then also to continue to, again, as I said, you know, talk about immigrants in that humanity and talk to other people also. Uh, that is, I think, what, what is really important for us. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you all. And thank you to those who were able to join us today. I also want to give a shout out to TC Moreau for uh, behind the scenes technical support and all those who brought today's workshop to being. So thank you all for being with us and um, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.